And for me, this bit in red here, I've become quite obsessed with this idea. Okay? So that idea that everything's pervaded by a fight between network and hierarchy, the, I can't, I'm, I'm beginning to, to have trouble finding things where that isn't the case in my own mind. Perhaps I've just become obsessed with that idea. But I think that a lot of what we're seeing in terms of politics, in terms of just the world in general, this is a very general quote, is this tension or fight between hierarchical structures and the network. And hierarchies tend to contain power, but the network is, is becoming more powerful in different ways and it certainly disrupts those hierarchies. And clearly the web is a, a just a radically significant network in terms of, of the way it's doing things that you were talking about as well, Rich. So as an example, so this is another, because just the very fact that all those tweets exist from, from Trump is an, is an effect of the network. And what's interesting to me, not so much about who Trump is, but, but the way, the, the, the mechanisms that are happening here, is that he's, he's disintermediated his own government, okay? He's disintermediated his own party. He could just go straight to the people, right? So in, in a way, he's the institution, which is like the man, yeah? So, so um, the man, not man. And, okay. and um, What's interesting about this tweet, and a lot of things that he said, again, coming back to the New York Times, is that he's also disintermediating the media. He doesn't need the media anymore. So historically, politicians would have to, to build trust by having some kind of relationship with the media, because that was their mode of dissemination. Okay? And so that would create a kind of balance, if you like. Now, really, it wasn't necessarily a good thing to have certain editors of certain newspapers sort of in bed with certain politicians or the rest of it. I'm, I'm not saying that that was a wonderful world that had all sorts of problems. But now, <clears throat> somebody in power like Trump doesn't even have to play that game. So he can, he can take down the media as well because he has the ability to talk directly to people, which works when you're in that kind of magi magician mode. Now, the problem for us in terms of trust is that historically you, you might subscribe to a certain newspaper and that would represent a certain kind of critical viewpoint or a certain political viewpoint. So you might subscribe to the Telegraph or to the Guardian or to the Daily Mail or whatever it was. And you would know explicitly kind of where they were coming from and the nature of their journalism. So it was quite it was quite visible, it was quite explicitly stated. The the the, the, the kind of unsettling thing about the network is that we can't, so this is a story about how um, uh, a hedge, uh, somebody who's really rich perhaps used social media to manipulate people's views on Brexit, okay? And, and I, think, I think what's unsettling in terms of trust is that we can't, we can't um, identify why certain things are in front of us. We don't know how they've been put in front of us or who's put them in front of us, okay? So when we look at our social media feeds or other, because they're not mediated by an institution that we may have once trusted, we can't tell what their provenance is. So in higher education we talk about, well, we, what we should do is we should make sure that people have got really, really good critical evaluation skills. But the fact of the matter is, how can you critically evaluate something when its ideology is in the algorithm that put it in front of you rather than the thing itself? Okay, the thing that you need to interrogate is no longer visible, it's like three layers down. So, my interpretation of that is, that, is, is this, is that code is a form of politics, so this is where it's taking place. Politics is taking place in the algorithm, the, the ideology is in the algorithm. And I think for some people, for a number of years, would have the view, well, computers aren't people, so they're, they're not ideological, they're just machines. But clearly, once you've got a network, the, the code becomes actually where the, where the ideology lives, okay? So the way that code is, de is de designed, who's designing it, and to what end. But in trust terms, it makes it very difficult for us because, as I say, we can't, we can't see it, we can't grasp it. It's in the background. It is a little bit like a kind of magical text, isn't it, which only certain people can interpret. So that's one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum, 
it, so that's the sort of network social media end of the spectrum. The other end is if we think about well, where do people get their knowledge from and how do they trust it? I think you have to look at Wikipedia, which is which is such a radically huge event in terms of the way that knowledge is produced and distributed, if you like. And it is, it, it is mind-crushingly amazing Wikipedia. And it's strange that we don't talk about it more in some ways. But what's interesting about Wikipedia is that it was, it was if, if you think about the network hierarchy thing, Wikipedia was, created, is, was generated on a network basis, in the sense that anybody could contribute to it. And unlike a hierarchical institution like a university, because anybody could contribute to it, it meant that they had to consider what they meant by a decent piece of information quite explicitly, in a way that perhaps we don't so much in higher education, because we just say, well, that's a trusted journal. And we, and we, and we sort of say, well, everybody who contributes to it is qualified to a certain extent. Nobody involved in Wikipedia, we don't go by the qualification, so you have to actually start to think, well, what does it mean for something to have to be of value? And they've got these great pages about um, their epistemology, basically, which is based not on truth, okay? So if anybody ever says to you, well, the problem with Wikipedia is it's not true because anybody can contribute, you can say to them, Wikipedia is not about truth. It's about verification. Yeah, I can never pronounce that, okay? Um, Essentially, the way that Wikipedia is constructed is quite radical, but it floats on an incredibly traditional notion of what, of what a verifiable source is. Right? Um, and so this is a really big deal. So if we want to talk about the way that knowledge is produced and distributed and about trust, if Wikipedia says that a source is not trustable, then that has a massive impact on the world. Okay? So I, 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 personally, I was quite pleased to see that happen. Um, so that's at the other end of the spectrum is, is you know, we've got social media in, uh, at, at, at this end of the spectrum in terms of the way that information is distributed and the way that we come to an understanding of it. And then at the other end, we've got this kind of collaborative endeavour to, to produce a kind of ultimate, the ultimate collection of, of, of knowledge and information that you, that you can trust, but not based on truth. Okay? It was, it was also intriguing to me that for less than the price of coffee a week, you could help secure the Guardian's future. Which, uh, when I, you know, when I was younger, what you do is you buy a newspaper. But apparently now you're supporting the Guardian's future and you're saving journalism. So if you think about the tension between network and hierarchy, that's what it looks like. That's how it appears in the world. Okay, because you know, 10, 15 years ago, these people were kings of the world. Do you know what I mean? So, I mean, in terms of the network really shaking things up, that is that happened fast, okay? So just thinking about trust, and tr this is utterly bombastic, which makes me feel more like Trump than it should. But I don't know why I wrote that down quite like that. But I think, I suppose what I'm trying to say is, I don't think that truth is the thing that we should be focusing on. I think we should be looking at how do these things come about and what do they mean, right? What's the... What, what created the environment that allowed these things to happen? And what's the meaning of what's going on? So you just do a great job of sort of picking apart the meaning. So instead of saying, well, clearly, everything that Trump says isn't true, that, that doesn't get us anywhere. The question is, what, how is that construction taking place? So tr if, truth makes, if, if truth is for children, truthiness makes us all children. Okay? How many people have heard of the term truthiness? Okay, interesting. So truthiness like prefigures this idea of post-truth. It's actually a relatively old idea um, by web standards, by digital standards. And it comes from Stephen Colbert. And I, I maintain that truth... So it, it's interesting, there was a quote that you had from a journalist about Trump. And you can see how it equates to this. Okay. And... I maintain that truthiness is not something that can happen in a, in a purely hierarchical environment. It can only really come about because of a network, because it gives voice to individuals, okay? Hierarchies will tend to iron out the problem of truthiness. They have their, all, all their own problems. But this has got something to do with the fact that we can disintermediate institutions. And there's something really interesting about that when it comes to uh, what well, basically the kind of the, the larger system if we think about it in terms of capitalism. And again, this does equate to the sort of magician type thing that you were talking about. 
which is that since sort of about 1989, you could argue, that there aren't really any really powerful externalities outside of a sort of capitalist system, which is why Marx came up with this idea of capitalist realism. And so, you know, when people say, so if, if something inconvenient happens, or if something, something happens in the world which doesn't equate to the world view or the direction of particular people in power, they will just claim that it didn't happen like that. And they can do that because there's nothing outside of that world that has a powerful enough voice to say that they're wrong. So, you know, this is where alternative facts come from, okay? Is that it's outside of their interpretation of the world. Now, we all do this, okay? We all have a worldview, and there are all sorts of things that fall outside of our worldview. Like, so for instance, for example, Rick, you said that, that uh, superstition and all this sort of stuff was, wasn't real, because that's outside of your worldview. Mm -hmm. But there's plenty of people, it would be inside their worldview, and they put you outside of it, okay? So, really, I suppose what I'm saying is that it's not a question of, of, of truth, it's more a question of whose truth. And who's getting to say the truth and to how many people and on what basis? Okay. Um, and I, I think that's what politics looks like at the moment. Um, so there's an interesting sort of resonance with that principle and social media and things like, um, you know, uh, filter bubbles, homophily, echo chamber. And you could argue that what the network allows us to do is to, is to engineer or have engineered for us our own little worlds, all, all these separate little worlds that allow us to reject interpretations that fall outside of those worlds in quite a powerful way. It's one of the things that the network allows us to do. But what we can't tell, as the ideologies in the algorithm, is to what extent that's being manipulated. So th and then trust starts to fall apart. Okay. So I think just for the you know to as a as a as a, a kind of idea for, for the rest of today for tomorrow, I think the question that I'm asking is well under those circumstances what does trust look like in a network era? Because most of our understandings of trust come from a hierarchical era, the era of institutions where we put our faith in an institution where somebody like Trump would have simply been a figurehead or the voice of a larger institutional structure, but because of the network, he's now his own institution. So can we redefine what trust looks like? Because one thing I don't think we can do is we can't say, <clears throat> oh, well, fake news, everybody needs to be able to figure out fact from fiction, because it's absolutely exhausting. And I don't believe that we ever did that. I think what we used to do is subscribe to a particular newspaper and trust that journalism. So we weren't necessarily critically evaluating it, we just chosen a source of information that conformed to our world view. Now that might have been significantly less dangerous because you could argue that those institutions have a kind of balancing effect. Whereas the problem with the network is because it disintermediated those institutions, you, have, you, you can have the magician running the world, okay? Instead of in the back room somewhere. So that's my question really to, to, to you as a group is, what does trust look like in a networked era? Can, do we need to redefine it, or do we just need to reiterate things that we have faith in from a kind of previous era? But I do, I'm gonna use the word believe, that's interesting, isn't it? I do believe that it is something to do with that fight between network and hierarchy.